What you're seeing is a visual representation of a set that has no size. It's not that its size is zero or infinity, or that we just haven't found the right tools to measure it. This set can't possibly have any size whatsoever. By the end of this video, you will understand exactly why. In 1902, the French mathematician Henri Lebesgue introduced a radically new math theory that quite literally turned integration on its head. By generalizing the notions of length, area, and volume, Lebesgue's novel technique allowed mathematicians to integrate a broader class of functions previously thought impossible to deal with. This revolutionary theory would eventually lead to the modern development of probability theory and even provide the framework that physicists would use in formulating quantum mechanics. But before that could occur, a seemingly simple question left unanswered by Lebesgue needed to be addressed. Do all sets have a size, or does a set with no size exist? Or as Lebesgue himself put it in more technical language, the much more interesting question, can one specify a non-measurable set, remains unanswered. The resolution to the problem would ultimately require the use of the recently developed axiom of choice, and was solved later that same year by an Italian mathematician named Giuseppe Vitali. The abstract generalization of size that Lebesgue invented is appropriately called the Lebesgue measure. It formalizes the intuitive notion of length, area, and volume, allowing mathematicians to consistently talk about the size of objects in any conceivable dimension. We refer to the size or the Lebesgue measure of a set using this notation. L is just a function that takes in a set and spits out some number that is the size of the set. So it can be anywhere between zero and infinity. And there are three basic rules that the Lebesgue measure obeys. First, the length of any interval from A to B is B minus A. So the length of this segment is four, the length of this segment is two, and so on. The length of a single point is always zero. Next, if the length of this interval is three and we slide it across the number line in any direction, then the length should remain the same. The technical term for this is translation invariance, and it's typically written like this. Finally, if we take two sets that are entirely disjoint, so they have no points in common, then the size of both sets is just the sum of each of their sizes. And this is true for any number of disjoint sets, even a countably infinite number of them. The technical term for this is countable additivity. Lebesgue's initial goal was to have an additional fourth rule, that L was defined for all subsets on the real number line. Due to the ingenious work of Vitali, however, this quickly became a logical impossibility. Vitali discovered a set so strange that it contained an uncountably infinite number of points Yet if you attempted to assign any non-negative number as its size, it would result in a contradiction. The way he did it is as follows. Begin with the interval from zero to one. Our goal will be to sort all the numbers that are in this interval into separate groups. We'll visualize this by using different colored boxes. Here, I'm only showing two boxes, but eventually there will actually be an infinite number of them. We'll first sort the numbers based on whether they are rational or not. So any number that can be written as a ratio of whole numbers will go in the blue box. And any number that can't be written in this way will go in the green box. And we apply this sorting procedure to the entire interval. Next, we consider all possible pairs of numbers in each box. And then check whether the difference between them is rational or not. If the difference is rational, then they will stay in the same box. If the difference is irrational, then they are separated into different boxes. For the blue box, any two numbers you pick will both be rational. And by subtracting one rational from another, you will always just get another rational. So all the numbers in the blue box stay put. That's easy enough. Now let's consider pairs of numbers in the green box. Applying our rule now, We'll keep pi over four in the green box, but we'll move pi over six to a new box. These new labels will make more sense in just a few moments. We will set the blue and purple boxes to the side for now and continue focusing on the green. Now let's consider pi over four again. And in addition, pick out pi over four plus one half. 
If you subtract these, the difference is negative 1 half, which is irrational. So pi over 4 and pi over 4 plus 1 half both stay in this box. We then continue with the same process. We keep picking pairs of points in the green box. If their difference is rational, they go in the same box. If their difference is irrational, they go into different boxes. In fact, every number that is of the form pi over 4 plus some rational will stay in this green box. By repeatedly applying this simple rule, we can sort out all the numbers in the entire unit interval into different boxes. Each number will have one and only one box that it belongs to. The technical phrase here is that we have partitioned the unit interval into different equivalence classes. Although I've shown just a finite number of boxes here, at this stage, not only do we have an infinite number of boxes, but each and every box has an infinite number of points in it. For example, this box here has all the rationals in it. This one here has pi over 6 plus all the numbers that differ from it by a rational number, and so on. Any number that you can possibly think of in the unit interval will be found in one of these boxes. The next step will be a little tricky, but bear with me. If you go slowly, you will be able to understand it, and it will totally be worth it in the end. We'll now make use of the axiom of choice, one of the nine axioms of set theory that form the foundations of math. Choice guarantees that we are able to pick one point from each of the boxes that will act as a representative of that box. For example, you can pick one half from the box that contains all the rationals. You can pick pi over 9 as a representative here. We already have pi over 4 and pi over 6 as representatives of these boxes. Now although we can do this explicitly for some boxes, in general we don't know what is in each box. Nevertheless, the axiom of choice still guarantees that even if we can't explicitly state which number we're picking, we can always pick one representative out of each box. We then form a new set V that consists of each and every single one of these representatives. And here it is. This is the set that Vitaly discovered. A set that is non-measurable. It has no size. As soon as you try to assign any size to V, it must result in a logical contradiction. I'll now show you why. We represent V as these dots on the unit interval. We then consider translated copies of V. To do this, we will take a rational number, say 3 fourths, and add it to V. This results in the entire set V being shifted by 3 fourths to the right. If we shift by minus 2 fifths, we get something like this. Our goal is to do this with all the rational numbers between minus 1 and 1. And since the rational numbers are countably infinite, we can make a list that enumerates all of them. We can then use this list to make an infinite number of copies of V by just shifting V with each one of these rationals. Let's call V plus Q1 V1, V plus Q2 V2, and so on. Now there are two key results related to all of these sets. First, the collection of all VIs is pairwise disjoint. That is, for any two sets you pick, they will have no points in common. The proof of this is quite simple. Suppose there was a point in common. Then some representative in one of these sets will equal another representative in another set, where QA and QB are just some rationals in the list of rationals we just made. But since the difference is a rational, then X and Y must belong to the same box, contradicting our initial assumption that we picked X and Y from two different boxes. The second key result we need is that every single number in the unit interval is in one of these VIs. We can see this as follows. Take any number x in the unit interval. In our initial construction of V, we placed every single point into different colored boxes, so x must be in one of them. Consequently, x minus any other number in this box must be irrational. So let's pick one other number in the box and call it x bar. Then x minus x bar is irrational. Moreover, each of these is also in between 0 and 1. 
so x minus x bar must be between minus 1 and 1. Therefore, x minus x bar must be one of the rationals we enumerated in our list. And x just equals x bar plus qj, which means that x must be in vj. That is the shifted copy of v given by v plus qj. With these two results in hand, we are now ready to show that v is non-measurable. The next step we take is to combine all the translated copies of v. So we take the union of all the vi's from i equals 1 to infinity. Since we only shifted v with rationals from minus 1 to 1, then the entire union must be contained in the interval minus 1 to 2. And we just showed that any number in the interval 0 to 1 must be in one of the vi's. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, by the countable additivity property, the size of the union is equal to the sum of the sizes of each vi. But each vi is just a translated copy of the original v. So their sizes must be the same. And the size of the union is an infinite sum of whatever the length v is. Additionally, the length of the two intervals on either side provides a constraint on how large this sum can be. It must be between 1 and 3 but there's no possible size that v can be. If the size of v is zero, then this infinite sum is just zero added to itself an infinite number of times, which just gives zero. If the size of v is greater than zero, even if it's some extremely small number, then the sum will be infinity. So the size of v can't be zero, and it can't be anything greater than zero. So it simply has no size. If it had any size, it would always result in a logical contradiction. So the set V is the answer to Lebesgue's much more interesting question. It is fundamentally non-measurable.